Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this Bone Matters webinar. I'm Rose, Head of Information and Support here at the Royal Osteoporosis Society. Hello, I'm Sarah, Specialist Nurse and ROS Clinical Advisor, and together we're going to be hosting this session tonight. It's all about broken bones, also called fractures, and the effects that they can have, and hopefully how can you can live well despite having had these fractures. So thank you for joining us. It's lovely that there are so many of you on the webinar tonight and so many questions. That's all great. So over to you, Rose, for a few more points. Thank you. So before we get started, a few housekeeping points. So you'll notice, first of all, that everyone except our speakers is off camera and muted throughout the webinar tonight. But if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there are two boxes. One is labelled Q&A and the other is labelled chat. So the Q&A box is where you can post at any time tonight your questions. And we're going to be watching this box very closely and we'll be selecting from these to put to our panel Q&A at the end. The chat box is for communicating with other people on the webinar. You're very welcome to close the chat box if you do find it distracting at all. Um, but it's there as your chance to connect with others if you wish to do so. The webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be shared on our website after the event so that others can also benefit from all of our fantastic speakers tonight. Although just to reassure you that nothing that gets posted in the chat box is going to be uh, viewed on the recording of the session afterwards. Right, so tonight we're going to be focusing on pain and symptoms caused by osteoporotic fractures, sometimes called fragility fractures. And we, we hope that we're going to help you really manage better the impact of fractures, the, the impact they can have on your life. And that by the end of the webinar, you're going to understand more about dealing with both physical and psychological aspects. You're going to know more about the best approaches and treatments that seem to work and also take away some practical things that you can do. And we also hope that you're gonna feel su supported by being here with this community of medical experts, as well as people who share your experiences. We've got four experts joining us tonight, and you'll have received full bios in your email beforehand. Now, two are specialist doctors. One is a specialist physiotherapist, and we also have what's often called a patient expert, so someone with a story to share. And the order of the day, well, the order of the evening will be two presentations, two short presentations. Then you'll be able to listen to a recorded interview and then at the end, plenty of time to answer, as Rose said, all the questions you've been sending in. Um, if you uh, submitted a question as a charity member in advance, then thank you very much for that. We have selected some of the most commonly asked questions and we'll be putting those to the panel. But as Rose said, any more questions you've got at any point during the session, pop them into the Q&A box and we will be picking some of those for the panel to answer. So that's most of the information. Uh, um, before we start, we're going to do something called a poll. I don't know if any of you have used these before, but we want to find out a bit more about your experience of fractures. So you're gonna see on the screen two questions. Um, and the first one is really about how broken bones fractures might have affected you. And the second one is about where you have had fractures yourself. Now, don't worry if you're not able to fill this in. It's not essential, but it's just to give us a little bit of context to understand a bit more about you as our audience. That's great. We can see everyone's participating, which is really nice. So we'll just give you a moment or two to think about that. Still some movement there, Rose. So Yes. People filling Thank in. you, everyone, for, for giving the poll a go. It's really interesting to see how those answers are shaping up. So that's the first question. Um, and then the second one, as we said, is, as I said, is where you have had fractures. So if you can um, have a look at that one too. Can we scroll down a little bit to, to see the second question? Okay. Well, I think as we expected, it looks like um, a good proportion of people have actually, or do indeed have fractures with pain and symptoms, um, which is, I think, as we expected. And that's, we're really glad that you're here. Yeah. 
And really interesting as well to see that we have um, a real mixture of fracture sites potentially. So around half um, having fractures in the spine, um, but 17% with fractures in other parts of the body and 20% with fractures in, 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 in both and, and a proportion who just aren't sure as well. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you. So before we hear from our first speaker, we just wanted to say as well, and as has been uh, shown by those poll results very much, that we're aware that some of you are going to be experiencing long term pain problems. Um, and sadly, this being a webinar, we, we can't see all of you at home. But on the positive side, it does mean that you are free to stand up, move around and think about your own comfort during this session. So we would very much encourage you to do that. Please do stay comfortable as we go through the session this evening. Now, let me introduce our first speaker of the evening. So Professor Terence O'Neill is a metabolic bone specialist working at the University of Manchester and Salford Royal Hospital. Professor O'Neill chaired the group of experts who created some new guidance for healthcare professionals about managing spinal fractures. And he'll be setting the scene for us tonight about common fractures and how this guidance can help. Welcome Professor O'Neill and I will hand over to you. So um, good evening, everyone. And I'd like to uh, thank Sarah and Rose for inviting me to participate in this webinar and living well with fractures. And so in the next 10 minutes or so, I, I hope to address some common questions around fracture occurrence, including how common uh, they are and what are the most frequent uh, or the most um, common fracture sites, uh, what symptoms people experience when they have fractures, uh, and I'm going to focus um, particularly on spinal fractures and particularly given the uh, poll, which we've just had, suggesting that I think the majority of people have uh, experienced uh, vertebral fractures. Uh, and then I'll close with talking about how to support those with symptomatic fractures to get the right care and talk a bit about the guidance for healthcare professionals that Rose uh, talked about that the Royal Osteoporosis Society have produced uh, around management of symptomatic vertebral fracture. So in relation to my first question, how common fractures are, the answer is very common. Based on a, a recent report from NICE, it was estimated that there are uh, about half a million fractures which occur uh, each year in the UK. And that's a, a, that's a big number. Uh, fractures we know uh, also increase in frequency with age. And this graph shows data from the UK and shows that the frequency of fractures increases quite rapidly with age from around the late 50s uh, in both women, uh, as shown here by the red line, uh, and in men, uh, as shown here by the blue line. And this increase uh, in fracture with age is thought to be due to a combination of a gradual reduction in bone mass resulting in a gradual reduction in bone strength uh, and also an increase uh, in the risk of falls uh, in older people. Now, the most frequent fractures are fractures affecting the hip, uh, the wrist and the spine. And these account for probably about half of all fractures over the age of 50 years, uh, with the other 50% uh, comprising a range of other upper limb, lower limb and pelvic fractures. But of all the fractures, and again, perhaps reflected by our experience in the poll today, spine fractures are the most frequent, uh, and affecting about one in eight men and women over the age of 50, and up to one in four, that's about 25% over the uh, age of 75 years. Now, in terms of peripheral fractures, that's fractures of the arms or legs, most fractures occur after some form of triggering event, such as a fall, uh, and cause severe pain and restricted movement of the affected site. And so people with these fractures usually attend uh, in emergency departments or, or, or one of the walk-in centers where the relevant X-ray is performed, which typically shows, as is shown here in the top left of the screen, a break in the bone. In this case, this is a forearm bone, and shows a clear-cut break in that bone. 
And that fracture then is treated. It's stabilized with either plaster of Paris or uh, a sling, uh, depending on the site, or sometimes for some fractures, including, for example, hip fractures, uh, it requires an operation to repair. Now, spine fractures are somewhat different. Um, for spine fractures, back pain is the most common presenting symptom. And these fractures can be triggered by a fall or a minor trauma, but often uh, they occur following some form of routine activity, such as lifting uh, or twisting or bending. And spine fractures are different also from uh, limb fractures in that they're recognized on an X-ray as a change in shape rather than a clear-cut break. And this is shown here on the right-hand slide. Um, the affected vertebra here in the middle appears squashed. This is the fractured vertebra which appears squashed, and that's compared to the, to the vertebra uh, above uh, and below. Now, all fractures, including spine fractures and limb fractures, heal over a period of six to 12 weeks. Over that period of time, symptoms gradually improve, severe pain to less marked pain. Um, however, for many people, uh, symptoms persist for much longer periods. And so for spine fracture, for example, uh, the evidence suggests that at least 50%, if not more, people who have a fracture of the spine continue to have back pain for at least a year after the fracture event and often longer. So why is this? So I say most fractures heal within three months. So why do people get ongoing symptoms? Well, I think the reason for the persisting pain is it's due to a combination of factors, but importantly, I think it's because when the fracture occurs and this change in shape occurs, that puts pressure, the spine changes shape somewhat, and that puts pressure on the adjacent muscles, the adjacent ligaments, adjacent joints, and also the shock absorbers, the discs that will separate the vertebra. And all of these structures have pain uh, sensors and can contribute to pain post-fracture. And that's important in terms of implications for rehabilitation, which we'll talk about uh, later in the session. Some people also, there's pre-existing um, spine problems like wear and tear, and that change in shape can put pressure on that and again, further uh, exacerbate symptoms. Another consequence of this change in vertebral shape is that over time, people can lose height um, and they can sometimes develop a, a curvature of the spine. And this becomes a bit more marked if more than one fracture occurs. And so this combination of height loss and pain um, uh, can interfere with um, balance uh, and also routine daily tasks involving bending and standing. Uh, such as washing up and cooking uh, and also getting dressed. Other symptoms occur also, which actually those people affected and their carers, and indeed many healthcare professionals, often don't recognize as being related to the fracture. And so this, in, and then we can see because of the change in spinal shape, there's increasing pressure in the tummy and in the chest. Um, and these symptoms then which can occur uh, are Consequence of that uh, and include fatigue, uh, exhaustion, uh, sometimes loss of appetite, heartburn, uh, urinary symptoms, um, and perhaps not surprising, uh, given all of these things, psychological symptoms including uh, low mood, fear of falling, uh, and also issues relating to body image. And in many people, it's sometimes these symptoms which can cause significant distress and adversely impact on quality of life. And despite this, for many people, these symptoms are unrecognized as being related to the fracture and, and undiagnosed. So in terms then of management, I think um, recognition of these symptoms that are linked with fracture, um, not just the pain and the, the, the function of these other symptoms is an important first step in obtaining the right care. And that goes for both patients and all their healthcare professionals. So understanding and acknowledging the symptoms, including the physical and psychological symptoms, I think can also help patients engage with the self-management techniques, uh, which are important in management and also help build confidence to engage with healthcare professionals involved in their care. 
And so self-management has a, an important role in the management of pain and also living with fracture symptoms. And we'll hear more about this, I think, in Emma's talk. Uh, and there's a range of excellent resources on the Royal Osteoporosis Society website, which Rose will cover later in the session. So the focus of healthcare professionals for people with fragility fracture is often importantly uh, to initiate people on treatments such as the Cosnets to reduce the risk of further fractures. Um, and whilst this is very important, it's important to recognize that these therapies don't affect in any way any of the current symptoms a person is experiencing. And there's often less focus on care and help for pain by healthcare professionals for these other symptoms, including the physical and psychological symptoms caused by the fractures, uh, including the support uh, for self-management. So recognizing this gap, the Royal Osteoporosis Society this year published guidance for healthcare professionals on identifying and managing these symptoms linked with vertebral fracture. And this includes management of pain, uh, other symptoms, support for self-management, and also signposting uh, patients to various resources to help manage their symptoms. And the guidance includes, importantly, also uh, specific key practice points and suggestion for cares uh, in these areas for healthcare professionals. And it's hoped that this guidance will provide the support for the healthcare professionals to help those affected so that they can get the best care. So I'd just like to close then by uh, summarize by saying that fractures are common. Uh, they cause significant pain, disability, and impact on quality of life. And symptoms often persist for a long period after the fracture is healed. We talked also about the importance of self-management and the role it has in improving symptoms. And also recent guidance um, should improve or help uh, provide healthcare professionals with the support needed uh, to help those with symptomatic fractures uh, and ultimately uh, improve patient care. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Terry. That was really, really interesting, really set the scene for us. And I think um, and I share the excitement. I know of many of us who worked on the, the group who, who produced this new guidance. And we really hope that it's going to change things for you and that really it, it's going to raise the profile and help you to get the care that you need. So thanks very much for that um, introduction. Um, now we're going to move on. Um, I'm going to introduce Professor Emma Clark. Um, Emma works um, out of Bristol University and in the Bristol hospitals, um, and as well as advising patients uh, on, on managing fractures, um, Emma Clark has got a particular research interest in spinal fractures, um, so she's very much the right person to be helping us today, um, and she has published papers on um, really the experience of spinal fractures, which hasn't, uh, isn't always uh, given the prominence it should have, uh, and also other really important areas like who should be referred for x-ray, etc. So hopefully we might come on to that later. Um, and should say that um, Professor Clark and Professor O'Neill were part of the expert group who produced the guidance that um, Professor O'Neill mentioned. So they're the right people to be here with us tonight. So um, welcome, Emma, and looking forward to, to your talk. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. And hello, everybody. I'll just um, share my screen and hopefully that will work. Um, I'm just going to press that button. Um, so, um, uh, right. So this is the um, income I receive over and above my salary, but it's not going to um, influence what I'm talking about today. And I'm going to start um, this um, session um, on describing the range of experiences um, that um, people can have after fractures, very similar um, to um, what you've heard from Terry. But this is this diagram is taken directly from that document for healthcare professionals. And the aim of this is to raise awareness both amongst healthcare professionals, but also you about which of your symptoms might be related to your broken bone or fracture. And if we start at the top, you know, pain is an obvious symptom. Um, and um, in a bit, I'll talk about plans you can have to manage your pain. But it's increasingly recognized that 
other things also happen to us after a fracture. And these might include impacts on function, um, including mobility and activities of daily living. You know, for example, um, after a wrist fracture, it can be more difficult to do daily self-care tasks like washing or dressing. Poor uh, pain and poorer function can contribute to anxiety and depression, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then other emotions, thoughts and feelings can be affected by a broken bone. For example, if the break occurred after a fall, um, we can become quite fearful um, and that can inhibit us um, from going out, meeting our friends, engaging with our support networks because we're frightened, we're concerned about having another broken bone. Our body image can be affected. You know, some of my patients describe hating the shape of their forearm or the shape of their spine um, after a fracture or a broken bone. And um, as Terry um, showed you, um, we know that um, the shape of the spine can change after a vertebral fracture, and that changes the shape of our uh, chest, our thoracic cavity, and our um, tummy or abdomen can change shape or position, which can affect our appetite and breathing, and pain can reduce our appetite and make us short of breath. A broken bone means sometimes that we're more likely to fall, particularly in the early stages. Um, for example, you know, limping um, due to pain, which can affect balance. And specifically after a vertebral fracture, we've already seen that increased curvature of the spine, which means we're leaning forward a bit more. Um, and so possibly are more likely to fall. Um, and um, when we're talking about fear, um, we've already heard about how this can uh, make us less likely to go out and affect our social circumstances. And finally, all of these actually, I think pain and um, fear, um, thoughts, feelings, emotions can disturb our sleep. However, there are simple things that you can do and that healthcare professionals can offer you to help all of these symptoms. So let's focus on pain to start off with. And I'm going to talk about medications and then non-medication help. And so in terms of medications, many of us use pain relieving medications that are also called painkillers or analgesics. But I'm going to um, give you some questions um, to help you think about how you can use your pain relieving medication more effectively to best suit your individual personal circumstances. And in my mind, the most important question is really around when you experience that pain that you want help with. So perhaps your pain comes on when you do a specific activity. And if it's a regular activity, then plan to take your medication about an hour before you do it. So an hour before you go shopping or an hour before you go on a car journey. Perhaps your pain is all the time that you want help with. And if that is the case, you should try taking your pain relieving medication regularly. You could consider thinking about a slow release preparation that lasts 12 hours. So you only need to take it twice a day. Or perhaps your pain is mainly in the morning. And in that case, you could take a slow release medication lasting at night that lasts about 18 hours. So it has its main effect in the morning. Or perhaps your pain is mainly at night and stops you sleeping. So think about pain, pain relieving medication about an hour before bed or specific medications for night pain. And a second helpful question is, where is your pain? So, for example, um, um, a, br a broken wrist or finger or bone in the foot might be helped by pain relieving gels and creams or pain relieving patches might be helpful if your pain is more widespread. But when thinking about your medications, you should also think about your allergies and sensitivities. So for example, um, some people um, are allergic to plasters and therefore can't use some of the versions of their patches. Uh, and also think about what other medications you use. And if you're not certain, please don't be afraid to ask. And so the actual pain relieving medications can sort of be split into four groups. 
The first is paracetamol. It's very well tolerated with almost no side effects and should be used up to eight a day for pain that's present all the time. Or you can take two an hour before doing that activity. The second are anti-inflammatory medications, also called non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. And these should be used carefully in people with asthma and COPD and carefully in people with kidney problems. But they can be taken in addition to paracetamol if just two paracetamol is not enough. The third group are opioids, and these can be very constipating and make people sleepy. But in my experience, that's because they've been prescribed very high doses. For example, I have patients who are prescribed the 30 milligrams of codeine with paracetamol and told to take two, which means they've taken 60 milligrams of codeine. And, you know, consequently, they feel sick, they're drowsy and they're a bit constipated. And I would actually recommend you get the um, um, medication that is eight milligrams of codeine with a single paracetamol. And so you could take one of those with a single paracetamol and with an anti-inflammatory, for example. So you're taking low doses of three medications, which are likely to improve the pain better than high doses of one on its own. And finally, there is amitriptyline, which at very low doses seems to help people in pain get a better night's sleep. And what I would say is try taking your pain relieving medication in a sensible way for you. And if this isn't working, then um, get some advice from your pharmacist, your nurse or your doctor. And now I want to raise a few other ideas about pain. So first of all, I'm going to say that it is not always possible to prevent pain completely with medications. And in fact, as we get older, I'm afraid daily pain is pretty normal. But that's OK, um, as long as it's not too bad and it's not stopping you doing things. And part of today is to think about what other things you can do so that the pain does not have such an impact. And what I would say is, is if it is um, your usual pain, um, then it's not going to be happening because of ongoing damage. And it is fine to just get on with things. And importantly, I do want to say that it is possible to improve pain from broken bones with time and with simple um, self-management. And I want to reassure you that this is the case. So um, moving on to non-medication help, I'm going to start by saying that there is no single approach that is going to help everybody. And I hope you'll try some or all of the suggestions from today. And I expect that you'll do that. And some will make absolutely no difference to you at all, but others will. So first of all, I'm going, we're going to talk about if your pain is intermittent when you do something. And the first um, thing I'm going to range is perhaps you should stop doing that activity that makes your pain terrible. And I say this to lots of my patients and lots of them are pretty outraged that I would suggest such a thing. So I had a patient who found that ironing made the pain from her vertebral fracture just terrible, really, really painful. And I suggested that perhaps she doesn't need to iron. And she thought I was very slovenly for suggesting such a thing. And so instead, we worked together to try and find alternative ways of doing this task, alternative ways of doing her ironing to make it less painful, as there are aids that can help with tasks. And I'm just going to show you a range of things that you could consider and try. So let's think about um, sitting first. So starting down the bottom here, um, if you work and you find that um, sitting at a desk makes your pain worse, there are now these sit to stand desks. And um, I would say that in all of these pictures, this chap's got a lovely back. He's sitting with his back curved backwards in that perfect postural position that we call extension but I think his laptop is far too low you know it should be level up with his eyes but that is an option as I say if you work moving on to this picture here this is a specific type of um, seat this is a perching stool there are no wheels 
and the seat is slanty. And this is actually the aid that allowed my patient to do her ironing much more easily. I'm not saying pain free, but certainly much more easily because by leaning and sitting on this, it puts your back into that extension position. So she was able to do her ironing like this rather than leaning forward over her ironing board. At the top here, this is an illustration of a lumbar roll. You can purchase this or you can get a rolled up towel and do it yourself. And again, it gets your back when you're sitting into that lovely curved back position. And then there are seat wedges, which you could try on your seats that you already have at home or in the car, for example. Then let's think about sleeping and pillows to start with. Um, there are a wide range of different shaped pillows available. And one option you could do if you have pain at night in your back or your neck um, is to go to a large department store um, and go to their bed section where you'll be able to lie on their bed and try out some pillows. And then you can always leave the department store and have a think about it. You're not under any obligation um, to purchase it immediately. Others of my patients find getting out of bed um, a time when um, that really sets off their pain. And so there are other ways of getting out of bed that lots of people may not have thought about. So, for example, and there is this aid, but you can just roll onto your side and put your feet down and then sit up. So rather than just levering yourself forward to get up, which might be the way you've always got up as a child. Now um, a time to um, think about a few other aids um, that, um, that can help with pain relief. So this is a cold pack or um, a heated back wrap. You don't have to buy a cold pack, by the way. You can just get a bag of frozen peas and wrap it in a tea towel and apply it to your back for about 10 minutes. I don't know if it will help you, but it might do. Or perhaps the heat will help you more likely. You know, you'll just have to try and see what suits you as an individual person. And finally, there are corsets or braces and, and taping. So this, these three are specifically for people with vertebral fractures. And I have to say, there is no evidence that um, recommending this to everybody is beneficial. Um, but I would say that I have some patients who do find them helpful in specific situations and other patients that it makes no difference or they find them incredibly uncomfortable. So these um, 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 uh, taping or sort of plasters, really, you put on the, your lower back. And I think a few of my patients find them beneficial because I think what happens at the end of the day, when we're all sort of slumped, it pulls on your skin and reminds you to sit up. So that might be something if your pain is towards the end of the day. This more rigid corset um, how, I, I've seen it helpful in some patients in the early stages of vertebral fractures, but other people find it just unbelievably uncomfortable and they just can't wear them. I don't know what it will do for you. And then this more softer corset. I've got a couple of patients who put this on just before they go shopping. And they find this um, gives them enough pain relief, doesn't get rid of it, but gives them enough pain relief to be able to do that comfortably. Um, and other patients I've got who it makes no difference. As I say, you will need to try um, some of these things dependent upon your symptoms. But if your pain is all the time, I think you need to think about other techniques. So what about relaxation? Again, I don't know what you're like as an individual, but you know, you'll have a way that you can relax. Perhaps it's having a hot bath. Perhaps it's going for a walk. I don't know. Think about distraction. You know, that is very underrated, actually. Read a book. I don't know. Play in a video game, whatever it is. Do something to distract your mind from the pain. And definitely think about more activity, not less. And I will come back to this because this is a key part of self-management. And again, do ask for help. There are a range of things that can be tried. And if you're trying them and it's still not helping, um, ask a professional. So let's move on to um, exercise. Um, lots of people say, does this help or does it make things worse? And I know that patients, but also healthcare professionals, are actually a bit fearful of recommending activity for people with osteoporosis or previous broken bones. And because of that, um, I've done some research with Royal Osteoporosis Society to actually look at 
all of the evidence. So we looked at studies where people were assigned to do exercise and, um, and where people were not assigned. And all of those people had osteoporosis and broken bones or some had broken bones. And there was no evidence that there was a higher chance of broken bones or injuries or fractures in the group assigned exercise. If anything, it's probably the group that did not do exercise that were more likely to break bones. And that might be um, because exercise strengthens our muscles and stops us falling over. And in addition, it's also beneficial in loads of other ways. It's good for our heart, you know, it's good for our body weight, it's good for our sense of well being. And we can even do activities or um, movement straight after a broken bone um, because it can help with pain relief and actually particularly after a vertebral fracture it may help um, reduce pain because some of the pain at least is due to muscle spasm in, um, around the spine and what do I what do I mean here so for example if you look at this um, line drawing here what this is, is just slowly moving your elbows out. And that's therefore moving the muscles of your spine without you bending forward or backwards. And this one here, you bring your elbows up because that again gets you into that lovely extension position of the spine. And then just really gentle rotation to just gently get those muscles moving. And then after the, at the early stages of a broken bone, the aim of activity is to work on balance, strength and cardiovascular activity. And what I would say is start off slowly and build it up and anything is better than nothing, because remember, it's got loads of benefits. And what I would say is it doesn't have to involve you putting on lycra, going to a gym and getting sweaty. It can just be activity. You know, think about walking around your house more, going outside more, walking to the shops and buying less so you have to go more frequently, perhaps go every day to buy a newspaper. You know, this is activity that helps um, with balance. And do consider to, uh, asking for a referral to an exercise professional or a physiotherapist to guide you if you're really worried or can't find something to do. So time for a bit of a recap about the principles of self-management and what this means it's understanding which of your symptoms could be due to your fracture and realizing that with time and help pain and other symptoms can improve learn about the types of things that can help and that's of course the point about today definitely think about changing those situations that make your pain and symptoms worse but ask for help if the things you've tried aren't working. OK, something slightly different now, and not all of you will have experienced this, but some of you will. And after a broken bone, it can actually be pretty frustrating, frustrating with the pain, with the pace of your recovery. We can get angry, angry with ourselves. Oh, if only I hadn't stood on the back of the sofa and reached up for that thing or Anger with other people. If only that person had controlled their dog, I wouldn't have, you know, broken something. Self-pity and fear. We've talked about fear of further fractures and fear of falling. And all of this can actually become quite overwhelming and can um, increase the likelihood that we develop low mood or depression and anxiety. And we know that these thoughts and feelings make our pain worse actually. They reduce sleep and they reduce our ability and our motivation to do self-management, which then makes everything worse. And it's this cycle that happens. And what I would say is if you feel that your thoughts, feelings and emotions are getting in the way, you can actually self-refer um, for some psychological talking therapy that can be hugely beneficial. And that's called IAPT, which stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. And every region in the UK has access to this. Either look online or ask at your GP practice, but also think about speaking to your practice nurse or your GP. And then finally, I just wanted to focus on increased curvature of the spine after a vertebral fracture, which we call this hyperkyphosis. 
And the issue with this is it can increase the risk of falls, it can restrict our breathing, it can cause our belly, our um, abdomen to protrude, and it can alter our body image. And what I would say is there are things that can be done. We know that balance and movement training can help with falls despite having an increased curvature of the spine and can help with breathing issues. There are specific exercise programs which can help that reduce the spinal curvature slightly, but not a huge amount, I have to say, but it's more that they can help with the breathing and the falls. And things to think about if your appetite is affected. What about smaller, more frequent meals? You know, eat five times a day rather than three times. Or think about drinking those protein shakes between your meals. Or if it's because actually chopping up the food and doing the cooking is agony with my vertebral fractures. Think about how you can do it easier. Get it delivered as ready meals. Sit down to do it. Get a perching stool. And I just wanted to um, talk about urinary symptoms because there is an increased risk of incontinence of urine with um, a curvature of the spine in men and women. And if this is um, you, your practice nurse is expert in teaching you pelvic floor muscle training. So don't be afraid to ask. So I would say there are many symptoms that can be troublesome after a broken bone. But there are some techniques that can be helpful. Change the way you take your pain relieving medications, change the type, change the activity. And don't forget distraction, relaxation and ignore it. Do more activity, not less, and ask for help if you need it. And be reassured, pain after a broken bone will improve with time and with self-management. And just to again reiterate what Terry said, is after a broken bone, if you're over 50, really everybody should have their risk of further fractures um, assessed. They might need a bone density scan and you might need medications to reduce your risk of broken bones. But in addition to that standard sort of management of osteoporotic fractures, I want you also to think about these self-management techniques to address pain and other symptoms. And hopefully healthcare professionals will start to do this much more now the guidance has been released. And I just want to say thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll pass over to the next person. Thank After you. I stop sharing. There we are. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clark, for that really detailed look at pain and symptom management. And thank you, everybody, for all the questions that we can see rolling in in the Q&A. Um, do keep them coming. And uh, because we're keeping a very close eye on these and we will be putting um, them to our panel at the end. Just a reminder to please do put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat. But also you may wish to post in the chat um, and share your experiences with the other people who are here in the session tonight. And particularly as we move into the next uh, talk of the evening where we're going to be hearing from Annette. So Annette has had a number of spinal fractures and we're going to be hearing about her personal journey and how she coped. Annette spoke to our nurse manager, Julia, in a pre-recorded interview, which we'll take a look at just now. My name is Julia and I manage the specialist nurse team at the Royal Osteoporosis Society and we're lucky enough to have Annette Brown with us here today just to talk through some of the issues that she's experienced um, after sustaining some fractures as a result of her osteoporosis. So welcome Annette, lovely Thank to you. see you. Thank you so much, very happy to be here. I wonder would you like to um, tell us a little bit about when you first fractured? Yes, of course. I, my, I first presented with um, a very pain, painful back problem in May 2020, so a little over two years ago now, but I wasn't diagnosed until the September, so it was quite an excruciating journey up until I was diagnosed with the fractures, and that was only after an MRI scan because I knew there was something other than a muscular problem. Um, and at that point, it was found that I had four fractures, four spinal fractures. So it was all a massive shock. 
And at that point, there was um, a query about um, osteoporosis. And then it was as a result of, of a DEXA scan that it was confirmed that I had severe osteoporosis in my spine. Um, I think the, the, the more difficult part was in the September, just after I'd been diagnosed, I had an, a yet another fracture, which actually was a, a very, very painful fracture, which which led to me being admitted to hospital for a week. And that was really when when the journey for me really began. I can imagine. So how did you feel when you first experienced that pain and you didn't know what it was? You had no idea um, that yeah. must have been hard. That was that was a very, very interesting part of the journey, to be perfectly honest with you, because I'd, I'm, I was I was and am a very keen gardener. And it was after a, a bout of, of gardening that I had a really painful back. And I just thought I put it down to just overexertion and a muscular problem. But over the, the corresponding two weeks, that problem didn't get any better. In fact, it, it, it got slightly worse. And um, my GP saw me. And and again said, you know, it's muscular. You've just strained your back. And he referred me to a physiotherapist at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital who gave me some exercises to do, bearing in mind that we're right in the middle of COVID at this point. So everything that we're doing is, is online. So nobody's actually physically examining you. And again, I, I, I was doing the exercises, but knew that there was something not quite right. And I insisted that um, I had an MRI scan. I said to my doctor, look, there's something not right. This is not muscular. And eventually I had an MRI scan. I had to pay for it myself. Otherwise, I would have had to have waited for four months. And it was after that that um, that they diagnosed the, the fractures. And to be honest with you, I was in so much shock at that point. I really I couldn't speak. I was so shocked because it had not even entered my radar that it could be spinal fractures and it never even entered my head that that it could be osteoporosis so it was a massive life-changing moment and it was the one of the most the scariest things that's ever happened to me that's that's the only way i can i can describe it it, it, it really was very very scary indeed how did that affect your daily life when you were given that you know you knew you had those fractures did it affect you psychologically were you fearful of doing things yeah i tick all of the above i felt all all of those things and i i think the period from from having the results of the mri scan and the dexa scan and then there was a period where nothing happened in terms of um, interventions from healthcare professionals. So I was in a bit of a limbo, really. And I think most people will know that the the tendency is to consult Professor Google and to find out as much as you possibly can about something that you actually know very little about. And to be honest with you, the, the more I did that, the more frightened I became and I stopped doing it. And it was at that point that I came across the um, Royal Osteoporosis Society um, online and um, the Nurses Helpline, which was just like a lifeline for me. And the problem I had, I suppose, was that nobody thought to um, start the process of medication when I had the diagnosis. It wasn't until I was hospitalised with that fifth fracture that everything really started to kick in. I was on painkillers, the right painkillers. I was on the right medication. Um, I had a consultant um, who was looking after me. So all of that started to happen. So it was a massive period of time when I felt so frightened and so alone and so vulnerable because I just didn't understand what was happening to me. And more importantly, I was really very, very fearful about what the future would hold for me, having been a very active person. And um, I just couldn't do any of the things that I would have done on a day to day basis. So I couldn't drive. I, I could barely lift a kettle to, to fill the kettle. I couldn't cook. I couldn't iron. I'm still I still still don't iron now because I don't want to. But it's all the day to day things that all of a sudden you can't do anymore. Tell me a little bit more about the impact it had on those around you, um, people perhaps you're you know, close to. 
Yeah, it, it's. I think that my partner who who said to me, um, and she's an incredibly strong person, that the worst thing for her was that you can't feel somebody else's pain, so you don't know the level of pain that somebody's in. And and I'm a I'm a bit of a be strong person, so I don't talk very easily about those types of things. I, I, I'm more likely to say, yeah, don't worry, I'm I'm fine, where actually I'm 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 really struggling. So that's one thing. I learned very quickly was to share how I was feeling with those that were closest to me because unless you do that they don't know and they're just as frightened as you are but they won't often say that because they don't want to heap more pressure yeah. on, on you so so that's really important and it's you have to share those experiences and find a way through it to, together you know I'm sure that there are people who are diagnosed that have families, you know, children living at home and they have to deal with, you know, continuing to bring up and look after those children. And that's, you know, it's scary for the children as well, I'm sure. So just talk and, and share how you're feeling and find a way through it together. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think obviously that's something that, that's really important. Um, what else helped during those difficult times, would you say, or, or on your journey through them? Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the the actually funnily enough, the fact that we were in lockdown helped a bit because nobody else could do anything, yes. and I couldn't do anything anyway. But I think what what helped me a lot was was the the attitude that I took, which was about don't don't worry about what you can't don't spend your life thinking about what you can't do, but it's find a way to concentrate on the things that you you can do. And the, the journey to recovery will be different for everybody. I absolutely understand that. But it will it will improve and you will over time find that you're able to do more and more and more. And I, I, I really concentrated on those types of things. And I found I found different things to do, you know, hobbies that I wouldn't necessarily have done before that I could do from a seated position. I made sure that I was able to walk a little more every day to, to, to build up, you know, to build up the bone strength again and, and, and find positive ways of, of really making a difference to my recovery. Mm. And, and how did you manage your pain? What did you, do you do anything? Oh, that's a, that's a really interesting question because when I, having not been a person who's ever needed to take painkillers, I didn't really like taking them at all but the necessity is when you're recovering from um, any kind of fracture but particularly spinal fractures which are incredibly painful that you have to take some kind of painkillers and when I came out of hospital I was on morphine and painkillers have a terrible effect on the body in terms of the rest of your body they're not nice at all and I managed to I came down from the morphine through the stages of the cocodamol and eventually managed to wean myself off the pain I mean at the moment I don't even have to take a paracetamol I'm very lucky that I can manage my I can manage my pain um, in a in a different way um, but it's um, yeah for different people I think different people have different levels of um, acceptance of pain um, I think my pain threshold is is quite high so um, but I'm not you know I'm not in a great deal of pain if when I do certain things or overdo certain things then I'll, I'll have pain and I'll sit down for 10 minutes and that's that, that cures it. Brilliant thank you so much any advice you can give to any to others that are in your situation if you had to sum that up? Yeah I'd, I'd say you know be kind to yourself and listen to what your body's saying to you. And also, you know, reach reach out to people who can give you real advice. Um, don't, there, there's lots of misinformation around on the web, a lot. And, you know, be kind to yourself. Talk about how you're feeling. Talk to those that are close to you so they understand how you're feeling. Don't be afraid to ask for help, particularly if you're the one that's been used to doing the stuff around the house or whatever in a relationship, you're going to have to let go for a period of time. But rest assured that certainly from my point of view, things did get better over time and you will be able to, to do the things, some of the things that you were able to do before. But be kind to yourself and be gentle with yourself through that process. 
thank you very much indeed, Annette. That's been really useful. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. My pleasure. Cheerio. Cheerio. Bye. Well, it's down to me to say thank you. Annette's not here, but I'm sure you all found that a very useful sharing of an experience. In fact, I've been looking at some of the chat comments and somebody said very poignantly that Annette is describing my life. So I think that was really, um, and it certainly illustrated for me a lot of the things that the experts, um, the medical experts were saying earlier on. So, so thank you for that. And there is the opportunity, as you'll hear again, to listen back if you want to hear that story again. So moving on. Um, Really thank you to all our speakers so far. Um, I've certainly learned a lot, I'm sure you have too. It's now time for us to move on to our question and answer session. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, the previous speakers and also Karen Barker to join us. Uh, Karen Barker is a professor of physiotherapy in Oxford, so she's working with patients um, and advising them. But I also just want to mention she too has been doing some really important research in this area and looking at what physiotherapy treatments can help with spinal fracture symptoms. So great to have her too. Thank you, Karen. And she too contributed to the new uh, ROS guidance on managing vertebral fractures. So we've got a great panel here today um, and we're going to move on to begin to answer some questions. Thank you Sarah and welcome to our panel again. So first of all we're going to look at some questions which have been submitted in advance by Royal Osteoporosis Society members. Um, so thank you for all of those who, who sent those through in advance and we're going to start off with uh, some questions about exercise and movement. So our first question is quite a big broad one but certainly a very common question that we get asked. So a member asks us what form of exercise is best if any after a spinal compression fracture and Karen we thought perhaps you could start us off with this one. Okay, so I mean, there is no right set of exercises for everybody. The key thing is if there's exercise that you enjoyed before you had your fracture, so if you've always enjoyed, you know, walking or swimming, then find a way to modify it and carry on doing something you enjoy. Having a compression fracture is not a time to start doing an exercise you've never enjoyed and hated. So if you've always been a gym hater, you don't suddenly need to start. You need to find a balance of exercises that will help to strengthen the spine, exercises that will help to keep your range of movement, so something to strengthen, something to keep your mobility going, and something that is to do with balance. But there are numerous different types of exercise that will fulfill all of those remits, and it's really finding something that you can stick with, that you can do, and that you will enjoy doing. Exercise is meant to be you know, bordering on a pleasure. It's certainly not something to punish yourself with every day. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. And then more specific question now, but again, another common one is, can I drive my car um, with a spinal fracture or even with osteoporosis? Um, I don't know, Professor Clark, would you like to take that one? Um, uh, well, assuming you can drive a car before you got your fracture, then the answer is definitely yes. Um, 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 you know, I think um, there's no reason why driving is going to um, increase your risk of um, breaking bones or make your osteoporosis worse. Um, now, obviously, the, one of the main things you need to do is an emergency stop, which requires you to stamp your feet into the footwell. Um, and you might just want to practice that in a car, you know, in a stationary car, um, um, because I can imagine that if you had, you know, a pelvic fracture or a hip fracture in those early stages, um, you know, and that when you're still recovering, that that could be quite painful and you need to feel safe. Um, but assuming you feel safe and you feel that you would be able to do an emergency stop, then I'm completely comfortable with that. Um, it may be you want to look at your seating. We looked at um, the, those seat wedges. Um, another thing people um, don't necessarily realise, you can actually get a really long, I don't know if you can see my hands with this funny thing, a really long um, rear view mirror so that you don't have to necessarily do that to look behind you um you can get an extended mirror so that that can also be a little helpful tip i just pick up one caveat to that is if you're changing to stronger pain medication yeah yeah cautious 
in the days or two after that, just in case you get a bit drowsy and sleepy when you're driving. So just a wee bit of caution there. No, thanks, Terry. That's a really good point. Thank you. And another question about, about safety, really. So we get asked lots of these sorts of questions on our on our helpline for people who are used to playing sports. But we have a specific question from a member to ask, is it safe to play golf for anyone who's got severe spinal osteoporosis? And I think we take that to mean fractures of the spine, potentially. Um, Karen, would you like yeah. to... So, uh, you know, presuming that you were a golfer before, that you're not just thinking of taking it up, then absolutely no reason to stop. But you may want to modify your technique. So, for example, if you're going down to pick the ball up from the hole after you've you know, got your hole in one or whatever, then you may want to, for example, put your one foot back and lean forward onto your golf club so that you're keeping your spine a little bit straight and not bending too far. It... Um, it would probably be wise to make sure that you have got a um, you know, strong leg and strong trunk muscles. So you may want to do some sort of prehab to get some um, extra, extra strength in your muscles beforehand. I often advise my patients to um, book a, a lesson with the golf pro and give them a, some sort of guidance about things that they want to avoid and then get the golf pro to just go through with them how to do this. And, you know, there's other things that you, you probably would need to look at. I mean, probably the most risky thing playing golf when you've got um, um, a compression factor is lifting your trolley out of the boot of your car. Um, you know, particularly if you've got electric trolleys that, um, you know, those that's probably is the most hazardous bit. So you may want to think a little bit about the preparation for golf, but actually playing golf, no reason why you can't do it. You may just need to modify a couple of the movements on the course. Um, and in fact, a lot of my patients say that they play an awful lot better because they're trying less hard. So they're not trying to hit the hell out of the ball. And because they're trying a little less harder, they actually play much better. There's no guarantee of that though. Thank you, Karen. Some important messages there about modifying and what you're used to as well. Um, so moving on, we had uh, lots of questions about pain, some specific questions about pain. And um, we'll start with a question that a member put forward, which, again, we hear a lot of this, but um, it, it really about healthcare professionals not recognising the terrible impact of, of pain and disability following a fracture. And this member asks, what can be done to ensure that it's recognised that some people have to live with this? And, uh, and what, so what can someone do to make sure that their pain is recognised and they get the right support from their healthcare professional? And uh, Professor O'Neill, this is something that you touched on in your presentation. Perhaps you could pick up on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it, it's I mean, part is understanding the process, understanding that your pain is real, and having a conversation with your healthcare prof professional, um, explaining your circumstances, explaining your situation, explaining how it's affecting you. Um, and I think the most professionals will. I think engage with you on that, you know, with your symptoms and 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 help you through that in terms of you know treatments, pharmacologic therapies, and also uh, the self management um, uh, advice that Emma has been talking to you about as well. I think the other thing is there's a lot of healthcare professionals who will help you with how to manage the pain as opposed to how to get rid of the pain. And so they can give some very you know, useful advice about pacing, about if there is you know, something that you, you really want to do, you've got I don't know, a, a family wedding or something, how to um, modify your activity for the days leading up to it and then afterwards. So sort of the sort of overactivity, underactivity cycle. So um, I think, you know, talk to healthcare professionals about pain management as well as about pain control. Thank you. And we had a, a specific question um, from one of our members called Tricia, and she asked about how long it's safe to stay on morphine patches. And just to say, this is something, again, that we hear from a lot of people. And I know that it was mentioned in um, the chat in the Q&A box tonight, people with concerns about the addictiveness of opioids. Um, and Professor Clark, perhaps you want to pick that one up. Yeah, so I think um, I hear this as well, actually, a lot it is a lot of um, patients are concerned about this. And I think um, there's a couple of things to talk about. First of all, what do we mean by addiction? And I think addiction is portrayed in the media as 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 something where your teeth fall out and you start washing your hair and you live under a bridge, you know, and you, you, you know, and, and so you get, you know, drug addicts are addicted. Um, so that and, and I think quite a few of my patients are very concerned that 
they will sort of get into that habit or, or something. Um, but actually, what we mean by addiction with opioids is that our body gets used to them. So we need to then take a little bit more with time to get the same effect, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And because of that also, another component of that is we can't just stop it. And in fact, Annette um, on the video described, you know, really clearly how she left hospital on morphine and she managed to slowly, you know, reduce the dose, move on to a slightly less strong opioid. Um, and, you know, I personally wouldn't be fearful about the addiction side of things if it's what you need to be able to get yourself active again, getting back to the activities you need to do and want to do. Um, and it, then with time, we can tail it off or you can tail it off and get back onto a lower dose. So personally, I'm not that interested in the addiction nature of it. It is the terrible constipation, the drowsiness. And as Terry pointed out, you know, the potential dangers around that when you first go on it. Do you agree, Terry? Yes. Um, I mean, I think um, we need to keep in mind the sort of the natural history where you are in your, your spine fracture journey. So when you do something, pain can be agonizing. And we heard very clearly that that was the case. Uh, and so in those circumstances, you know, strong painkillers, morphine is, is often the only therapy that can control those symptoms. And it's important that patients are uh, remain active during this time because um, you know, there's a tendency because it's more comfortable to rest, to, to lie down and not move. And that's the last thing you want to do because your bones get weaker, your muscles get weaker, and it becomes much harder than to, re to do rehab afterwards. So it's crucial in those early stages of the fracture to, to have a pain control, which allows you to you know, keep up and keep active. Um, and as the pain natural history decreases, you know, the need for these very stronger painkillers will decrease. Um, and so, you know, and that story is kind of common. We, you know, it is, and it is usually possible transition, you know, into the into the uh, weaker uh, opioids, um, uh, you know, rather than staying on the stronger ones. I mean, it, it's, it's helpful to think about potential complications on those, you know, to take drugs to help prevent constipation, like higher fiber diets and stuff. Um, and, and sometimes depending on the, because some of these, drugs do have side effects in terms of headaches and drowsiness and dizziness sometimes you know taking therapies in a different way as a sort of patch or transdermal as opposed to a tablet you know can help reduce symptoms uh, from you know those stronger opiates um but they do have an important role particularly i think in that early stage and, and because the pain is getting better there is there's less concern that of a need to continue in the longer term thank you Great. So we had uh, a couple of questions about the um, symptoms after um, spinal fractures in terms of um, curvature. So our next question from a member was about, uh, she says, I'm worried that my posture will get worse due to five vertebral fractures. Is there anything I can do? Karen, would you like to? Um, yeah, so there are things you can do. I think that if you've got a a wedge fracture that will change your your posture to an extent but equally it has been shown by a couple of research studies and also from my experience that um, following a program of postural exercises you can improve your posture and you can reverse some of that sort of you know um dowagers humps like like appearance so um, I don't you can reverse it entirely, but you can make it a lot better and you can certainly help on the progression um, by keeping the, the back extensor muscles as, as strong as possible. And also just being aware of your posture and making modifications so that you're not, you know, doing a lot of activities where you're just you know, looking down all the time. And, you know, particularly probably looking at the posture you're in when you're sitting in a chair in the evening watching television. And, you know, I've got a lot of family members with osteoporosis and they hate me being around. So I'm forever going, you know, take that cushion out. You know, why are you hunched forward? So, you know, just think about it um, as you go through day by day. But it's not inevitable that you have it and it will get worse. It can improve. Thank you. We also had some questions about um, a protruding tummy. So there was a specific question about wanting to know whether it's something that's going to that, that will get worse or better. So uh, I don't know. 
perhaps Professor Clark, if you wanted to respond to that point. Um, I think, um, again, very similar to the curvature, that it's not inevitable that it's going to get worse. Um, and in fact, you know, if your posture improves a bit and, um, you know, you can do some activity to strengthen your core, then, you know, it is possible to actually reduce it slightly. Um, um, but in, in some ways, it is actually the impact of that protuberance that is more of a problem than the actual protuberance itself. You know, so think about, um, you know, your clothes. I believe there is an excellent resource from the Royal Osteoporosis Society about clothing in the context of vertebral fractures, you know, a range of ideas that you may not have thought about. Um, you know, think about, you know, if you can't eat so much, as I said, smaller, more frequent meals. Um, and then the impacts on um, urine symptoms, which your practice nurse could help with. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think it's important also to, to look after your, your diet and nutrition and your, you know, your healthy food so that your bodies are moving regularly because particularly a lot of people are on sort of medications which bung them up and, and that can make that feeling of bloating work. Mm. And sort of, you know, looking after your, you know, your nutrition kind of help reduce that and, 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 and reduce those kind of symptoms of bloating that some people experience. Absolutely. Thank you. We had another question from a member who, which was about um, osteoporosis drugs. So they asked, do osteoporosis drugs interfere with the bone healing after a fracture? Should I pause my weekly medication if I fracture? And if so, for how long? Professor O'Neill, perhaps you'd like to answer that one. It's a, a good question. Um, I mean, uh, my understanding of the evidence is that it doesn't have a, a significant impact on fracture healing. Um, the, the one trial which looked at um, preventing fractures after hip fractures, though they delayed giving patients treatment for a couple of weeks. Um, so I think following a fracture, um, we don't have great, you know, there's not a huge evidence base around this, but um, uh, I mean, I would suggest for uh, someone who's had a fracture to probably wait a couple of weeks, particularly when we're giving the you know, more potent therapies. But for someone on um, uh, already established on uh, bone active therapy, I'm not sure I would suggest changing it. And partly because I mean, we know that these treatments are long lasting in bone and they have a, uh, you know, a long half-life. So, you know, even stopping a treatment, the body's still experiencing that. Uh, it's still exposed to that treatment. So I don't think it would, would make any difference. Thank you. And Professor Clark, you're nodding, so I'm assuming. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I, I wouldn't stop the, the tablet forms of treatments at all. Great. Thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to Sarah now for just a few more questions from our members. Thank you. So, yes, I've got a few more questions from members and then I've been scanning all your questions that have come through. We'll pick some of those up, too. So I'll, I'm looking at the time. I, I want to get through as many as I can. There are quite a few questions about investigations for fractures um, and some of which I'm very much going to put over to uh, Professor Clark because I know it's an area of her interest. But the first one is rather interesting, actually. And this is for you, Karen. This is someone saying I've been told I can go and see my physio and get some exercises once my fracture is healed. Should I have an MRI scan to see if my fracture has healed? Which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so I don't know, two parts there. I don't know if you want to. Um, right, so A, you can go and see the physio before your fracture is healed. Um, really, from the moment you've, you've got um, a fracture, you can see a physio. The exercises you're given will vary depending on the amount of pain that you're in, the stages that you're at. But there's you don't need to wait for your fracture to be healed before you um, you see somebody for or by. So I mean, I would just uh, say that you feel ready to be able to exercise now um, and you know try and get that referral expedited. I think the reason people often delay making a referral is they think that if you you know if you presented and you're in uh, excruciating pain, I think there's no point sending you because you won't be able to do the exercise that will make the pain worse. But the reality is there's always there's always an exercise you can find or something that you can give somebody to do. And the mere fact that you're doing the exercise tends to make things better. So you know things like um, just 
generic exercises, you know, any exercise may be modified. So you start off doing it seated rather than standing if your pain's that bad, or rather than um, you know, doing something which involves lying on your front. It might be that you're propped up over some pillows over over a, a chair or a bed to start with. So there's always a modification. So I wouldn't wait until it's healed. I would just ask for that referral to be uh, brought forward and go and see them, uh, see them soon. Thank you. And I think, um, I don't know, um, uh, Professor Clark, whether you want to comment on MRI scanning. I know it's a for very specifically, it is rarely used, to, although it, it does show if a fracture is healed. But I would really like you to comment a bit more on this question about when to have an x-ray, because I know mm. it's an area of your interest. And there's one here, question saying, I've had six fractures within a year. I now think I've, I've, I've got another one. You know, should I be going on for having more fractures? More? So perhaps deal with that first, the thing about having follow on x-rays why and when would they be useful and then perhaps maybe move on to the first x-ray and when you might need one because there's a quite a lot of questions around that okay thank you yeah really important questions um so let's take um the example of somebody who's had say four fractures already and then they get another episode of back pain should they go and get another one um um so i suppose the question is is what would the benefits be of identifying if you've had another fracture? Um, so, um, and I think that it could be beneficial because it could mean that we would change treatments, for example. Um, but if you're already on one of our infusions or our injectable medications, then, you know, we may not change anyway, because it depends on your individual circumstances. Um, if the, um, if you've only recently started on the medications, we wouldn't change because they take some months or even longer um, to start working. So, um, you know, if you'd been in the situation where you would found the vertebral fractures, started on alendronate, for example, and then two months later, you get another episode of back pain, even if that was unfortunately another fracture, we would not change the alendronate. That's the, the tablet medication because it would not yet be working. Um, and my thoughts are that if you're if you get a worsening of back pain, you know, um, all of the self management techniques we've talked about already would be completely safe to do, even if it was another fracture. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I'm sort of hedging my bets, as you can see, um, because it's very difficult to actually identify, you know, to give general advice that's going to be useful is what I mean, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think you would need to discuss your back pain with a healthcare professional um, and, and then come up with a decision. But because I don't think it's always black or white. And perhaps you could talk a bit more about sort of first x-ray. Yeah. That's a really an area I know you've looked into quite a lot. Yeah. So this this is one area that I'm really hopeful that we are going to be able to produce better guidance for patients, for healthcare professionals. And by that, I mean nurses, physios, pharmacists, GPs, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but what we are working out is that the back pain people experience with a vertebral fracture is different to the back pain people experience due to muscle spasm or, you know, Pull, pull muscle or a bit of wear and tear arthritis or osteoarthritis um, and so because of that and because the fact that there are other risk factors as I hope you you know you know for for vertebral fractures such as you know um, height loss can occur that's another sign that you might have a vertebral fracture um, um, you know, um, whether your pain changes with particular activities, um, whether you've had steroids, your age, your gender, you know, some of these other things. And what I'm working on is combining them into a simple questionnaire so that if somebody in the future, an older person, you know, goes to see a healthcare professional with back pain, they go, oh, hang on a minute, but tell me what it is. And then it goes, yes, you, they need an x-ray because they're at risk of an osteopathic fracture. So there's hope that in the future, it will be easier. So what about now? Um, I think, um, you know, if you um, have risk factors for osteoporosis already, and by that, I mean, um, you are older, you're female, um, your mum or dad broke their hip, um, you're a bit 
I don't know, I quite like to say this, um, a bit thin, perhaps. Um, if you've been ill with other things such as rheumatoid arthritis, if you've needed steroids, um, if you've previously broken a bone um, and then all of that, you develop um, fair new back pain, then I, in my mind, that would be um, somewhat concerning. And the back pain um, um, in some people starts very, very suddenly. Um, I don't want to talk too long. What's the time? Um, in other people, it's um, start. It's a bit more gradual, actually. Um, but the back pain in in most people with vertebral fractures comes on. I'm just turning sideways so you can see what I'm doing. Comes on when we're in the position of work, and by that I mean that position. We're doing something. We're cooking or chopping or doing a jigsaw or whatever it is. We're just leaning forward slightly, um, and um, in my experience, patients with vertebral fractures describe doing something in that position and then their back pain starts. Oh, no. And it builds up and up and up and up and up. And then they've got to stop. They've got to stop. They can't do it anymore. And they've just got to lean back. And so that is a feature of the pain that we could use now, perhaps in combination with all those other things I've just talked about. There's no one single symptom that's guaranteed for a vertebral fracture. Thank you. And it's really great that you're doing that work, I think, too. Um, can I ask a couple of technical questions? This is for you, Professor O'Neill. People are asking about neurological pain. What does that mean? They've heard about nerve medications and why would, how would fractures cause neurological pain? I just wonder if you've got any comment. People do sort of want to know what is the pain. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah, so um, I mean, nerve pain can arise in a couple of ways. I mean, if, for example, a, a, a fracture, um, there's slight movement in the back and causes pressure on an adjacent nerve, or if there's kind of some slight bleeding or at the site of the fracture, it can cause pressure on the nerve, and that can cause what we call nerve referred pain. So about maybe 20% of people, when they have a spine fracture, the way Emma is describing, get pain, which refers to the front of their, their tummy, uh, to the front of their chest, and um, that, that usually settles down. Um, there, there is a different type of what we call nerve pain, where... If the body gets used to pain a lot, it, it starts to expect pain. Um, and so the processing within the brain, the brain anticipates pain and that area then be, can become more sensitive. So the actual pain is coming from, you know, that can become, you know, because the body's expecting pain, it becomes more sensitive to pain. Um, and that sort of pain um, is different in character and type. Um, it's often described as a burning pain. Um, it's more persistent. And there's often some tenderness linked to that. So touching the, the area can, can cause pain. Um, and it can be quite resistant to, you know, standard medications, the ones that Emma was talking about, the sort of paracetamol and codeine. Um, and so for it can, I guess the one thing to say, it can be quite hard uh, to distinguish these types of pain in individuals. Um, you know, I've seen patients with with classic and, and non-classic and neuro, neuro, what we call neuropathic pain, um, but there's a lot of people where there's kind of an overlaps. But there are some medications which target this kind of nerve pain. Um, I mean, amitriptyline, for example, is one type which can um, affect the, the processing. Um, so the, the pain which is experienced in the brain uh, and there's other medications, for example, gabapentin, is the other one which is sometimes used in that setting. Um, so there are therapies for that. Um, um, I mean, these therapies sometimes used in patients who just have chronic pain and have been found to be helpful in those cases. So for people with chronic pain, not necessarily neuropathic, it, it's sometimes worth a trial of these therapies to see whether it can have an, an added effect uh, on their symptoms. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, moving on. We have heard lots of sort of positive stories. I mean, Annette's story was one of hope as well as kind of expression of a lot of suffering. But I am noticing that there are some questions coming through from people who do feel quite desperate in that they say the pain is not getting better. So they understand that it should be and everybody has a different experience. But someone here who said, you know, I had fractures 18 months ago. Nothing seems to help. I'm 57. You know, day to day life is so painful. Will it ever get better? What can I do? And I just wondered, um, well, any of you really, whether you'd like to comment on that kind of persistent, what do you do really if pain goes on and on, everything's been tried? I don't know, Professor Clark, whether you want to start with something. 
gosh, I am very sorry to hear that. Um, it is difficult and I think you need to find somebody to help you. And I would say um, to make an appointment to see somebody in your GP practice face to face. It is happening. I know it's difficult, but it is happening. And talk to them about it. Because if you've had pain for 18 months, there's all sorts of things that will also be happening. I bet you're really anxious. I bet your mood is low. I bet you're not sleeping. And then, you know, as we've discussed, all of that makes the pain worse as well. Um, and so what you need is a real holistic approach. There is no point just giving you a painkiller. You need a painkiller. You need someone to look at your activities. You, some, you need somebody to um, help you with your mood and all of these things. And um, so find somebody to help you in primary care. You know, another thing to consider actually is also your high street pharmacist. I think increasingly as well, they are now being able to um, provide one to one appointments. So, you know, if you're finding it impossible to get into your GP practice, I would say, please um, um, think about other things. But GPs are still working. They're still seeing people who need to be seen and you need to be seen. Thank you. That's really, really helpful and encouraging. A um, couple of questions uh, from Professor Karen Barker. Um, I, we know we haven't got lots of time, but I just wondered in the next couple of minutes whether you could talk a little bit about what isn't safe. There's quite a lot of questions about yoga, Pilates, what should and shouldn't I be doing? So just a, a couple of comments on that. And so also, could, could the you things just... that you should try and avoid are if you're doing yoga or Pilates, you don't want to be doing a full fast roll down. You want to be doing it, you know, modified. There is a um, an ROS exercise sheet that gives modifications for Pilates. And um, I always tell my patients to print it out and take it to the Pilates class and tell the teacher, the instructor, and they will always then, you know, say, don't do this. Oh, you know, you just go down as far as your knees rather than going all the way down to the floor. Um, you know, with yoga, you know, I'd be happy with sort of half a slow type, slow control type yoga. Um, I wouldn't be looking at um, having patients doing a sort of fast, a very fast, um, you know, athletic type yoga. Um, so really it's about avoiding combined flexion and twisting and avoiding fast, uncontrolled uh, movements. It's about finding an instructor who is... You, know, you don't want, to, and I, I know it's I know it's easy to say this because obviously when you go to um, a leisure centre and it's a class of thirty, then it tends to be much more, uh, much cheaper and more affordable. But an instructor can't keep an eye on thirty people. If you go to a smaller class where there's you know six or eight people, a good instructor can then individualise it for you and say you know Mary, you want to miss this one out, do so and so instead, or um, they can spot if you're if your technique is wrong and you're going to do some harm. So every class always starts with the instructors asking, has anybody got any injuries, anything new, anything changed? So tell them, tell them what you can't do. If they're experienced, they will know how to modify the class. If they're not, give them the leaflet. Nobody is going to be offended if you say, well, I've, I've downloaded this. Can you have a look at it? Um, and don't be uh, um, embarrassed that there will be maybe 10% of the class that you don't do and instead you'll carry on doing a different exercise. That's um, you know better to do the 80, 90% you can do than to not go because there's a few of the exercises which are not good for you. That's great. And one last question for you, Karen, was just about pain whilst exercising. We get asked this too. So, you know, if I'm getting pain, does it mean the exercise is wrong? I just wondered if you could comment a little bit on that. Yeah, so I mean, pain while exercising to an extent is normal. Um, so, you know, I get it. But what you need to worry about is is how how sharp the pain is, how bad the pain is, and does it stop when you stop exercising? So, you know, I think if you if you get some uh, mild pain whilst you're exercising, then back off a little bit, but carry on. If when you've stopped exercising, the pain settles down so that 10 minutes later so you're back to normal. That's, you know, uh, the fact that you're using muscles and parts of your body that you haven't been using for a long time. But you shouldn't exercise through sharp pain. You know, the pain shouldn't be where you're sort of gritting your teeth thinking, God, this really hurts. But, you know, what a physio always calls discomfort when they mean mild, moderate pain. 
I'm not worried by that as long as when you stopped exercising, that pain then set with and goes. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you. And uh, I'm afraid to say we're going to have to stop the questions and answers. There's so many interesting questions and um, yeah, really helpful, all the uh, contributions we've had. So a uh, time now to finish, um, not quite time to say goodbye, but I did want to a huge thank you to all our experts for their, their time and contribution tonight. It's been brilliant. Um, and we do hope the session has helped to some extent to build your confidence that you may feel a little more able to manage the impact that fractures have had or are having on your life. Um, one quick final point from me, um, we do want to understand the benefit of the session. So there is, as usual, a small survey we would really encourage you to fill in. We'll post a link to it now in the chat, but we'll also send it around afterwards to you via email. So we'd love you to, to, to hear your thoughts. It means we can go on with these sessions and hopefully make changes and improvements um, as time goes on. So I'm just gonna hand over to Rose briefly. Don't disappear. Uh, she's got some other uh, information support ideas to, to put across for you. Thank you, Sarah. And yes, a huge thank you to all of our speakers and experts tonight. So we really hope that the session has given you some good information about managing the impact of fractures on your life. But just to say that we know that living with fractures is a journey. And here at the organisation, we have a range of support services to help you through every step of that journey, hopefully. So first of all, I know we have a few members um, on the session tonight, but for those who aren't, becoming a member of our organisation for just £2 a month, you'll be joining a community of over 20,000 people living with the condition and it will help keep you up to date with all the latest news and support that you can get from the organization so we've heard a bit tonight about the just the psychological impact really and how difficult living with fractures can be we have a network of support groups around the uk which is a chance for you to meet face to face and online with others who are going through something similar um, and also to hear from speakers that are local as well and then we've been posting some links throughout the session. We have a huge suite of information resources for people, including um, films about spinal fractures, fact sheets and booklets on managing all aspects of um, living with fractures. And we also have specific videos um, picking up on the point that Karen was talking through at the end on how to move safely and how to um, sort of modify exercises if you're living with fractures. Uh, we do have our specialist nurse helpline, um, which is absolutely there if you've not been able to find the uh, content you need from our information and for those more complex queries the service is there for you. This has been part of our Bone Matters programme of online Q&A sessions and please do kind of keep watching for more of the programme in the remainder of the year and we also will be launching very soon a whole programme of online sessions for the year ahead so watch this space and, um, and then finally just to say the organisation does um, more than just support services so we campaign, research and all of our activity is funded by donations so there are lots of ways that you can get involved in um, supporting the work that we do at the ROA. And for all of that and more, go to our website, which is uh, www.rosbros.org.uk. So that brings our programme to an end for the evening. And thank you so much for everyone who's joined us live in the session tonight. It's been fantastic seeing all of your questions rolling in and your comments. So thank you for your participation. And yeah, thanks again from me and to our speakers for all their contributions. And we hope to see and connect you, connect with you again at another Bone Matters event. So take care and goodbye. Good night.